There's the diamond ring and the corona reaching out. Good evening. Well, we've had the eclipse of the sun, partial here, total in Turkey. Sadly, I wasn't fit enough to go to Turkey, but the Skype Night team did, and that's going to be our programme this evening. Here we go. Just the last slither of the sun, and it's like nowhere else on Earth right now. But all I want is for it to start with the total eclipse. I cannot wait to see Bailey's beads and enjoy the three and a half minutes of totality that we're going to get. But first of all, a couple of news notes. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbital Probe has reached Mars and began sending back pictures. And then Saturn. Saturn high in the sky now, and exciting news from the Saturn satellite Enceladus. Chris went to London to talk about that to Professor Michel Dougherty. You know, of all the results from Cassini, fabulous though they are, I think Enceladus might just be the strangest of all. Yes, I think it is, and partly because we didn't expect to see anything at Enceladus, um, but also because as time has gone on in the last year, we've got more and more exciting results out of it. Um, if you remember, the first two flybys that we had in February and March of last year seemed to imply there was this rather strange atmosphere there. And then we persuaded the project to take us much closer on the third flyby, and that confirmed that there was an atmosphere and all the other instruments on board Cassini confirmed it as well. But then there were some very exciting observations made of Enceladus in November of last year by a couple of the cameras on board. And they showed that there was this large water vapour plume coming off from the South Pole of Enceladus, which was occurring right where those tiger strikes or cracks on the surface were. And so this confirmed that we were seeing water vapour coming out. Um, this is what was generating this rather strange atmosphere. And what we think now is that it's, we're very certain that Enceladus is feeding the E-ring. There's this very large diffuse E-ring from the orbit of Mimas, which is close to Enceladus, all the way out to Titan. And so we're now very certain that Enceladus is actually feeding the E-ring itself. So we know there's a source of internal heating, it's melting the ice, so we could be talking about a substantial amount of liquid water as well. We could be. Um, that is one of the things that we want to try and observe if we can. There are plans for a, another very close flyby in 2008. And what we're doing on the Cassini project at the moment is planning two years of an extended mission. And so we're hoping to get some close Enceladus flybys into that extended time but too. Well, Professor Michel Dougherty talking about Saturn satellite Enceladus. And now, on to our main theme. On March 29, we had the total eclipse of the sun. Partial here, total in Turkey, where they saw the full glory of the corona. Sadly, I wasn't mobile enough to go, but Chris did with the sky at night team. So now, over to Chris at CD on the Turkish coast. Early morning on eclipse day, and so far, things couldn't be better. There's hardly a cloud in the sky, which is great news for the literally hundreds of thousands of people descending on this area from all over the world. At just before two o'clock local time, the moon will completely cover the sun's disk, revealing for just over three fleeting minutes the sun's pearly white outer atmosphere, the corona. It's something I've wanted to see all my life, and all we can do now is wait and hope the weather holds. Here on the Mediterranean coast, there's a choice of viewing locations. On the beach, sun loungers are in demand for the more relaxed observers who should be able to take advantage of a clear horizon. In the grounds of a nearby hotel, the top of a raised amphitheater provides a stable site for the equipment of the more advanced astrophotographers. It's an uncomfortable balance for them during the short period of totality, between wanting the best shot possible and enjoying the experience with their own eyes. Uh, I've bought a 1000 mil lens and a digital SLR with a uh, solar filter fitted to the front. It's a huge lens. It is. It's a Russian lens. Um, it's just a massive telephoto lens which gives a really large image of the sun uh, onto the chip. What are you looking forward to? The corona, I think, the most. Have you seen it before? No. We went down to Cornwall in 99. Standing on a hillside in the grey, in the mist, in the rain, and the shadow was something else to behold, but it is nothing like this, hopefully. So, is this your first eclipse? Uh, no, it'll be my third, including an annular last year. Looks like you'll be doing some imaging. I'm hoping to. Video camera, um, digital camera and film. <laughs> so, three eclipses, you're not bored yet? Uh, I, I think I'm becoming an eclipse chaser, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it is addictive. It is, isn't it? That's right. 
This telescope tunes in to one particular layer of the sun's atmosphere up in the chromosphere above the visible surface and gives us a sneak preview of some of the things we might expect to see during the eclipse. In particular, there are prominences, gas erupting up above the sun's surface, which shows up as bright pink flames around the edge of the moon's disk. Now looking through the telescope, yes, there are quite a few there already. There's some at the top of the disk and several round the side, so it looks like we should have an excellent display in just a few hours' time. So what are your plans for today? Well, um, I plan to look at totality this time. Um, I've got this telescope set up and I have to do some photography. Uh, the main thing is that I'm going to sort of split it, so sort of have two minutes messing around with cameras and then one minute uh, sort of just taking in the experience and absorbing the sort of atmosphere. And what are you hoping to see? I've gone minimalist. I mean, a lot of the people here have been able to bring some very sophisticated equipment. I'm just going to try and take some photographs and uh, maybe spend the first 30 seconds of totality bracketing the exposures so I can get some kind of result. Train at lots of different uh, exposure times. Yeah, I'm going to go from a thousandth of a second all the way down to 15. Maybe that'll take me a minute or so, and then I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it. That sounds very sensible. <laughs> So this is the simplest and probably the best way to see the start of the eclipse. Absolutely. Um, it's just one of the simplest approaches you could have. Cheap pair of binoculars costing about £10-15. Pounds, piece of white card to cast a shadow. And then another piece of white card just about three quarters of a metre away projecting an image of the sun. And there um, it is. And there it is. Um, I've used this several times now. I think this will be the fourth eclipse I've used it for. And I seem to get first contact um, not that long, just a few seconds after the guys with the big telescopes. The moon's orbit is inclined, and so the critical lineup of the moon between the sun and earth only occurs every year or two instead of at every new moon. We owe the stunning sight of a total eclipse to a cosmic coincidence. The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's also 400 times closer, and so they appear the same size in the sky. The shadow reaches out behind the moon, first striking the coast of Brazil before travelling across Africa, meeting us here in Turkey before ending up over in Mongolia. Meanwhile, the UK just catches the edge of the shadow and therefore sees a partial eclipse of about 30%, which Patrick hopes to observe from Selzy. Here in Turkey, Pete and I have plans to make. It's beautiful here, isn't it? I mean, we've got a fantastic view over to the southwest, and of course, uh, when the eclipse starts, we're going to see activity coming from that direction on the horizon. So let's go through what's going to happen. It's now, what, coming up to 10 o'clock? We've got, um, what's the time? Yeah, we've got about three hours, I think, before the eclipse starts. That's first contact. First contact when the penumbral shadow um, crosses southern Turkey. In other words, the moon starts crossing across the sun's disk. That's right. If we're looking at the, the sun itself, we see a little bit of moon starting to creep into the sun's disk. And then we've got about um, an hour and 20 minutes or so to uh, just marvel at the partial eclipse which is going to occur. It's fair to say that for most of the partial, if you walked out the door without knowing there was an eclipse on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice. You wouldn't know anything was happening But in that at all. last 10 minutes, things begin to be very strange indeed. That's right. We get into, um, I think, what we could call the panic zone. Everything is happening at once. Uh, we're having strange effects like um, shadows. The shadows start to change. The sky starts to darken. I remember from 99, the colours change as well. They do. As the light dims down, we get a, a, this strange sort of silvery grey colour, if you, or, or light, which uh, illuminates everything. Um, but as we get closer and closer to totality, we have other um, much more bizarre phenomena, like uh, shadow bands, for example. And what are they? Well, there, where you have this very thin bit of sun remaining, um, the light from the very thin bit of sun coming through the atmosphere, it gets refracted and wobbled by the atmosphere. And as it falls on the ground, it, it tends to look a bit like the ripples you get at the bottom of a swimming pool. They're quite close together, um, but if you have a white surface and you look down, you should be able to see these things. And then it's all eyes back to the sun for Bailey's beads. Yes, this is um, a very impressive part of second contact. They're caused by the edge of the moon, um, which isn't smooth. The mountain ranges and craters cause dips and bumps. And as the light from the sun shines through the valleys, you get this immediate burst of light in this area, which are called um, Bailey's beads. And then a particularly deep drop in the profile of the moon, you get this fantastic burst, which is the diamond ring. And quite what they will look like depends on the exact circumstances of the eclipse. And the profile of the moon at the time, of course. Um, and there are predictions to try and work out what Bailey's beads are going to be visible. And then during the three and a half minutes of totality, what will you be looking for? 
totality is going to be superb. I'm really looking forward to seeing the corona, of course. This, the sun's outer atmosphere. Yes, the outer atmosphere. Virtually nothing there, of course. It's just a very rarefied region around the sun. But that is going to look absolutely incredible. And it will shine, hopefully, with the brightness just below that of the full moon. And you never quite know what shape it's going to take. No, it changes shape um, quite a lot, depending on the activity of the sun at the time. At the moment, we're at solar minimum, of course. And the, um, the shape of the corona should be quite elongated around the equatorial regions, like a, a sort of lenticular shape. And it can stretch out to several sun diameters away. That's right, the very outer corona goes out for a, a tremendous distance. And so that's the corona. We've only got about three and a half minutes of totality. But as the totality carries on, of course your eyes, because the sky is dark, become more dark adapted. And because they're more dark adapted, they can see more things in the sky. And if you can drag your eyes away from the total eclipse itself and look to the right and down a bit, you should be able to see the brilliant Venus. And if you can see Venus, Venus is a signpost then to Mercury. And then on third contact, once again, the diamond ring and Bailey's bees. On the third contact diamond ring, it's worth saying, is actually more impressive than second contact because your eyes have become dark adapted, so you actually see this dramatic increase in light very rapidly. Well, it's going to be the shortest three and a half minutes of my life, I'm sure. Let's, and mine. <laughs> let's hope it stays clear. Absolutely. The moon's shadow can be thought of as a cone of darkness, which during an eclipse intercepts the surface of the Earth. Any place within the resulting ellipse sees the moon blocking out the sun, and a total eclipse. We're hoping to actually be able to see the shadow rushing towards us, something I remember clearly from my cloudy attempts to observe the last British total in 1999. It's about 11 o'clock local time, and right now, over in Brazil, the cone of the moon's shadow is just about to intercept the Earth's surface. When it does, it will begin rushing towards us at a speed of about 3,000 kilometers per hour. And just before totality, we should see the shadow coming towards us over the Mediterranean. We get about three and a half minutes of totality, and then right at the end, we expect to see the shadow shooting off towards the mountains in the distance. It should take about four or five seconds for the shadow to reach that distant horizon, and we set up this little camera to see if we can record the effect. It's 12.38 and first contact is almost upon us. Still nothing in the naked eye? Think I can see yes, something can now? See yep, see there we are, that's first contact. That's the beginning of the eclipse and things have finally started. Months of anticipation and the eclipse is underway. There we go. Uh, it looks like it's a, a small nibble has been taken out of the sun. It's amazing. Uh, we're, what we're looking at is the pinhole camera effect from a standard colander and you can see here that um, instead of little holes what we've got is uh, little crescents of sun. Sad isn't it? <laughs> so you've got a highly specialised instrument with you today. I certainly have, it's specially imported for the occasion. <laughs> and it's just a tea strainer? It's just a tea strainer but you know for a, a good quality tea. And it gives good quality partial eclipses? It certainly does, dual function instrument. Fabulous. Every eclipse is, even after 16 of them, they're all different, they all have their own personalities and I think people ask me after 33 years why, why do I still do this and it's it's, um, I think it's, it's connecting and I also think it's a, very, it's a very magnificent thing. You have to remember this is the only place, the only place in this solar system where this looks like this because of the same angular diameters of the sun and moon. And, and I wonder, sometimes you wonder if that's an accident or just good fortune. We've only got a billion years left and then no more totals, so you should right. take, make the most of it now. That's right. Thank you very that's much. Right. You're very welcome. It's my first, hopefully my first clear total eclipse. Give me a tip. A telescope, a camera, a photograph can't convey the totality of what's going on, word intended. Use your eyes, just watch the whole sky. There are many events, there are shadow bands, you can see this is an ideal surface for that being light in color. There's the shadow itself moving across the sky as the moon's shadow is drawn towards us. And that can look like a dark blanket being dragged across the sky at some eclipses. At others it can be very subtle. The sun itself with prominences and the corona is good. The 360 degree sunset all around, sunset colors completely around the horizon with a dark sky overhead and you will be able to see bright planets and the brighter stars in the middle of the day. And that's the most amazing thing. There's a little cluster of cells in your brainstem and that cluster of cells, no matter how many times you've seen an eclipse, no matter how scientific you are about it, about timing it, taking photographs, sees the sky going dark in that last 30 seconds before totality, God is turning down the big dimmer on the sky 
and that little cluster of cells starts running around screaming, the sky is going out, the sun <laughs> is going out, it's the end of the world. And you get that feeling every time. Being, yeah, it's that ball of cloth. It's just gradually creeping across. It's 40 minutes away from totality here, but back in England, the partial eclipse should just be reaching its peak. Let's give Patrick a call and see how he's getting on back in Selsey. Hello. Hello, Patrick. Chris here. Hello, Chris. You must be having a marvellous time. What's the sky like with you? Uh, there are a few clouds on the horizon, but we're 40 minutes from totality and it's completely clear, Patrick. I'm green with envy. Here, of course, we're going to have a partial less than 30 percent. It's tacky cloud. We've seen the sun all right and we're forgetting it, but um, <laughs> I wish I were with you, believe me. Yes, I can imagine, but what's watching the partial like? Have you managed to see the eclipse? Oh, yes, we've got some quite good views. We've uh, got some good views that I hope I'm photographs too, and we are using my telescope to project the sun's image, of course. Excellent. Well, the safe way of looking at it. Patrick, you've been in my position many times. What should I look for during totality? Well, first of all, of course, uh, the corona and any prominences that are around. They're the main things, really. We know there are several. We've looked in the hydrogen alpha, so we know there are several prominences. And there are sunspots too, of course. Well, they're, they're, there's, uh, they may be active areas. OK, Patrick, I'm going to go and put your advice into action. I'll talk to you after the eclipse. Right you are, and best of luck. Thanks, Patrick. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. With just minutes to go, I've chosen a location on the beach away from the astrophotographers. I'm hoping to see the sea change colour and the moon's shadow on its surface. Well, the first hour of the eclipse seemed to rush by in a twinkling of an eye, and now these last five minutes, for me at least, are really dragging. We're watching the colour go, we're watching the temperature drop, it's really getting quite dark now, but all I want is for it to start with the total eclipse. I cannot wait to see Bailey's beads and enjoy the three and a half minutes of totality that we're going to get. We're nearly, so nearly there. Once you have a crescent sun in the sky just before totality, the movement of the Earth's atmosphere causes strange shadow effects on any white surface like this. And we should see bands rippling forwards and backwards. So this is perfect. Of course. Designed specially. Yeah, courtesy of the <laughs> hotel. <laughs> We're very, very nearly in a total eclipse. And it's a strange kind of twilight. It's not like the sun going down. It's as if it's happening all around us. It's very cold. Colours are still relatively normal. But here we go. Just the last slither of the sun. And it's like nowhere else on Earth right now. This is the only place that looks like this. Still quite a blue sky overhead. Uh, kind of a midwinter blue, down to very light around the horizon and the moon shadow is now rushing towards us at thousands of kilometers an hour. We're very, very nearly deep in the cone, which started off in Brazil this morning, and has traveled across to meet us here. Here we go. It's really dark now. Look at the horizon. The horizon in the direction the shadow's coming from is very, very purple. The sun now, there's just a tiny sliver, and we may be expecting Bailey's beads very quickly. Any shadow bands? There's something there. Yes, look, there. The bands on the sh shadow bands, very narrow, very rapidly moving. Uh, there they are. Here we go. The horizon's dark. The last sliver is co covering the sun. Last, we're trying to watch Bailey's beads and watch the shadow come towards us as well. Here's the last sliver of the sun as we hit totality. Venus is going. There we go. Look at that. There's the diamond ring and the corona reaching out as the shadow hits us. It's a classic solar minimum corona. It's extended out. Uh, along the equatorial plane. There's one, two, three, four, five streamers at least associated with the, um, the prominences we saw earlier. It's a, a glowing ring in the sky where the sun should be. The pearly white corona reaching out maybe two or three sun diameters away from it. Down in the right we've got Venus, there's Mercury straight in between and it's still getting darker. Uh, there's a bright, almost a, an all-round sunset uh, with red and blues down on the horizon, and the sun up in the sky, absolutely beautiful. Now, can I see any prominences with the naked eye? I know they're there, but that is the most incredible sight. It really is. No wonder that the ancient astronomers were terrified when something like this happened. It's, it's awe-inspiring, it really is. I don't know how much time has gone. We've only got three and a half minutes. 
The corona seems brighter around the edge of the moon um, and then fainter towards the poles of the sun, uh, where it's not associated with the streamers. It's still relatively light, I would say. I'm losing track of everything that I meant to look at because I'm just looking at the solar corona and that is an amazing sight. I could just about pick out one or two prominences. There's one, 12 o'clock. I can just about see that with the naked eye. The pink flash as a huge amount of gas is thrown up from the solar surface and reaching up into the upper atmosphere. Just incredible. And you can see, see, as my eyes get used to the dark, I'm seeing more structure in the corona, which is immensely tenuous, hot gas reaching up away from the sun. It's, sorry, words, I knew words would fail me at this point. It's, it's very, very difficult to describe. I can tell you that no picture you've ever seen of a total eclipse does justice to this because the eye can pick out the close details near the moon and the fine, tenuous, wispy corona. It's really very light down on the horizon still um, as the moon continues its passage across the sun uh, and as the shadow sweeps across us. It's cold, I guess it's dropped at maybe five or six degrees. I certainly wouldn't be out here in a shirt on a normal day at this temperature. Um, and I think I can see brightening on the horizon. It seems to be, surely that can't be it. Surely we're not leaving the eclipse already. Um, look the other way and I can see people looking up at the site. Everyone on this beach has their eyes fixed on one thing, uh, which is that, sol that ring of fire up there, that solar a solar eclipse. And I can just see, here we go, here's the diamond ring. I can't believe this is over already. It's a diamond ring, get the glasses on. And can we see Bailey's beads? I don't see anything. There's just the one very, very strong diamond ring. There. There, and it's extending round the edge of the sun. And that's it. That's incredible. That really, there's still the diamond ring. You can just see the edge of the sun. And it's switching. It's gone. And that really was the shortest three and a half minutes of my life. Well, how do we describe that? That was absolutely awesome. I've never that really... doesn't even come close. <laughs> but... <laughs> the diamond ring at the end of totality, it was uh, amazing. It was like a sunrise in very fast motion. Absolutely the most fantastic experience. It's just so moving. Um, Fantastic. Um, spectacular, I think, is the, uh, is the simple word for it's it. It's our second attempt. We tried Cornwall in 99, but um, completely clouded over. But at last, we got to see it. The thing that struck me, one, was the size, and two, the sort of corona was really streaming. It sort of looked like some, some strange insect coming out either side. So this one was not a very bright corona. I've seen some that are much brighter, but it had a tremendous amount of very subtle, kind of a spun glass quality of detail to it. And what one thing will you remember? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey's beads were incredible and prominences came out from the Bailey's beads and were absolutely stunning, more than I expected. It's a surprisingly emotional experience yeah. and the diamond ring is just beautiful. See, that's how I'm going to remember this eclipse. One prominence either side of it. Oh yes, it's perfectly just... framed. <laughs> I didn't see shadow bands, which has, has upset me. And I'm I, afraid I, I did, Pete. I'm really sorry. No, I'm even more upset. <laughs> it was my fourth, and it was it, it was one of the best. It really yes. was. One of the four best, by any chance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the eclipse is ending, and people are packing up to go home. And it was an incredible experience, one which left me almost speechless, or at least incapable of saying anything sensible. We saw Bailey's beads. We saw a beautiful stretched out corona prominences, shadow bands beforehand, the colour of the horizon and the sky is something I'll always remember, and most of all, that beautiful final diamond ring. Nothing compares to the glory of totality. We didn't get that, of course. In England, we were the partial phase. In my observatory, I had Alan Schultz and Tim Wright, who took this rather nice picture. And in Glasgow, Jeff Smith got this nice sequence. And there are various other people, too, who send in images. Well, of course, totality is something entirely different. And that's where you were, Chris, with you, Pete. And that uh, must be a marvellous sight. What surprised you most? 
well, my reaction to the whole thing. We're a few days on from March 29th, and I still can't quite find the words to put it in. But in terms of specifics, it didn't get that dark. We were expecting to see the stars. We saw Venus and Mercury, but I looked east for Orion, and I didn't see it. And I'm still not sure why. It doesn't always. It depends entirely upon the sky. If the sky is not perfectly transparent, you won't get the stars. Ah, there was some haze about, so that's oh, yes. probably the explanation. Oh, that's why. And the other thing was, we didn't see the shadow rushing towards us. We picked the site specifically for this, and it wasn't there. No. You were looking over the sea, were you? We mm, were. Definitely. Well, because I was in 1999. I was tired out, but I, I did see the shadow. Well, uh, the camera we set up to capture the shadow saw something else instead, or picked up something else instead. You see the darkening, and then it brightens, and if you listen right at the end, you hear the frogs waking up for the morning. They certainly enjoy the eclipse. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> did you see the frogs? No, we tried very hard to get an image of them, but they <laughs> eluded us, I'm afraid. <laughs> now, what about the corona? Well, the detail was incredible. With the naked eye, it was elongated. Uh, it looked almost like a rectangle, a squashed beetle reaching out, rather. But the detail on your images, Pete, is incredible. I was very surprised, actually, how much detail we picked out. I, I thought it was going to be much um, plainer than that, but there's so many fine um, filaments and lines. And, and prominences? There were several, and actually you can see their links to the corona. They're, of course, material thrown up above the sun's yes, atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at the close-up images of them, you can actually see the structure of the sun's magnetic field, mm. the loops and twists in the coronal material around the prominence. It's really spectacular. I've seen one picture of yours, a very unusual one, showing the Earth shine on the moon. Oh, yes, that, that was actually one of my pet projects for this, um, this particular eclipse. And you got it. Yes, I'm very glad I got it, actually. I, I wasn't sure what I was doing. In fact, I think that's um, as a hallmark of eclipse photography. And you can see there the outline of the Lunar Maria. You can. And uh, if, you, if you look carefully, there are some craters on there as well. I've never seen that before. No, well, a few people have done this before, but it seemed quite popular, this eclipse. And the result is almost, almost as spectacular as the real thing. And nothing really. <laughs> but um, as something else you saw, and I've seen these two, shadow bands. It happens just before totality, um, and the sun is just a thin strip of light. And as the light comes through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets uh, messed around with by the Earth's atmosphere, refracted all over the place, and you end up with these fantastic ripples on the ground. They were obvious where I was down on the beach, uh, oh, but Pete, you but didn't I see them. them. No, I think I think we just had a, a mottled surface to look at, and I, I missed them. I'm very upset about that, and that means I've got to go to the next eclipse, unfortunately. Well, actually, well, yes. <laughs> I think we all have to go to the next eclipse. <laughs> yeah, one thing I find... An eclipse ends very suddenly with the diamond ring. And this is what I'll remember from this eclipse. The third contact diamond ring just hung in the sky. It was enough time for me to put my glasses on, take them off again, and the diamond ring was still there. Uh, and it was because the light from the sun was coming through a deep depression on the moon's edge, the Mare Australi. You know, before you went to the eclipse, you've never seen one. I've seen seven. And I said you're going to be startled, were you? I still can't describe it, and I can't wait for the next one. I imagine I'll leave you now an eclipse edit. And you too, Pete? Absolutely, yes. I'm not going to miss the next one. <laughs> well, thank you both very much. It thank was you. an absolute pleasure. It's a newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamped address envelope to Newsletter 101, Sky at Night, the mailbox, B11RF, or email skynight at bbc.co.uk. And when I come back next month, we were going much further afield and talking about galaxies and dark matter. So until then, 